My name is Brian McDonald. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister of Average Relations for the Yukon government. Uh, today we're here uh, in partnership with the Yukon College uh, starting a uh, speaker series uh, about the, the, the land claim process. And given that this is the 45th anniversary of Together Day for Children tomorrow, today's topic is about the uh, the document you hear here, and you know, basically, the, we have two distinguished uh, panelists here that are going to speak to their perspective on the first-hand knowledge of uh, of the process. Uh, so today, we have we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Judy Gingell, who is a member of the Quillen Dunn First Nation. Judy has a very long and distinguished public service career. Uh, you know, she started off uh, working with the then the uh, Indian Brotherhood, as, and she was the secretary for uh, on the executive for that uh, in the, the fledgling Yukon Native Brotherhood at the time, and you know was a signatory to the uh, Together Today for Children Tomorrow document. She also was the chair of. Uh, CYI at the time, now CYFN, or Council of Yukon First Nations, there before us, the Council of Yukon Indians, uh, from 1995 to 2000. And after that, she held the position of commissioner of the Yukon for five years and uh, has had a uh, also a, a long uh, position with uh, Quillen Dunn as an elders councillor as well. So she continues that uh, her work as a, you know, very much a, a voice for First Nations people, but also, uh, you know, the public service. As well with us, we have Sam Johnston, who at the time of signing, he was a signatory and he was the chief of the Teslin Clinkett Council. He served there for 14 and a half years uh, representing his people in a leadership position. Uh, he was also the, um, for eight years, he sat in the Legislative Assembly and was the first First Nations uh, Speaker of the House in all of Canada. <clears throat> After that, he had two terms, uh, totaling four years as a chancellor of the of the college here as well. So, again, a very long uh, storied public service career as well. So, we're very fortunate to have uh, both of you with us. And so, um, as before we pass over the mic, I just want to kind of I guess uh, seed the conversation, give you guys a little uh, some things to think about, and hopefully you can uh, you can tell us from your perspective, you know, what was the atmosphere like uh, in the room. Uh, when you guys were creating this document, but also when you, you know, were in Ottawa, just your perspective on what that was like going there, um, you know, recognizing that you know when we were talking earlier, uh, some of these people, you know, some of the chiefs and leaders had never been outside the Yukon before, let alone, you know, meeting in Ottawa. And I, you know, I've heard stories from, uh, you know, working with uh, Dave Joe and uh, you know with uh, you know, Victor Matander and things like that, people that were also around at that time that were, uh, you know, saying it was a it was a big deal for them to get outside of uh, out of the Yukon, and it was uh, I'd be interested in hearing. I think we'd all be interested in hearing what that was like for for our leadership of the day. Um, you know, some some of your thoughts on that, and if there are any other interesting stories that you could uh, share with us on that. So with that, I'll uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Judy maybe to uh, give us some some of your thoughts. Well, I'm trying to I'm trying to think back uh, to those days there, but I don't recall ever going down to Ottawa prior to 1973 but I, I might remember later but when the time when the day did come that we were going to go to Ottawa to present this grievance document to the to the prime minister um, this was all new to us to be in a, a, a city away from Whitehorse um, I'm sure there's a lot of you know what Whitehorse used to look like back then um, it's changed quite a bit, it's grown quite a bit today. But to go to Ottawa and to present this document was a real eye-opener. It was a learning thing as we were going along. And it was it's a good thing that we had some individuals within the government and our lawyers and consultants that were working with us to um, help us move this, this along. But I remember when um, leading up to that, um, every one of us, decide that hey we need to dress up so we had we had a lot of the chiefs going around town looking for suits and I think Sam could tell you some little bit more details on them with what kind of suits they were looking for but I just remember 
I had to help my dad, Chief Johnny Smith for the Whiters Indian Band then, and um, Elder Irene Smith, her and I were trying to fit him up with a suit, and then we ended up going back to our room. We had to hem the slacks up for him and fix around the arms a little too long, and we, did, we didn't know we could have we got them to do that for us, but we took it home, <laughs> we fixed them up. And um, myself, as you could see in the screen here, there's one, at that time, little Indian girl. That's me. <laughs> we were told we're supposed to bring our traditional wear. Uh, looks like I was the only one besides, <laughs> besides Ray Jackson. He's got his skin jacket on. But uh, when I came down, downstairs, and we're all getting in the bus to go up to the parliament, I was the only one wearing my outfit. And I really wanted to turn around and change my clothing, but there was no time. So there I go. And I noticed in the picture, as you probably see, I'm wearing my shoes. I forgot my slippers. <laughs> so anyways, uh, so all that is a lot of excitement. It's stressful and trying to fight, uh, find the right outfit to wear. And then going into the House of Commons and walking into this huge building. It's unbelievable. And this is all new. Or, you know, we all walk in line and get in there and finally going to see the Prime Minister. So I'll just leave it there for now and let Sam tell a little bit of his story. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, that was a really, really something for us. As a lot of us had never been out of the Yukon, let alone Ottawa. But all of us, at least we knew enough, we had to dress up because we had to go to the House of Parliament. And so all of us were, had our suits to wear, but there was one from Old Crow. He, he was a heavy set guy, and those guys, a couple of them really had to travel around. I don't know how many clothing stores they had to. <laughs> Finally found one sports jacket that would fit him. So at least he was decked out too, so. <laughs> and, but fortunately we had um, a man like Elijah Smith. That was quite why, why everything was accepted, well, how we can get into the parliament and all that. As Elijah, a lot of you may know he was one of the World War II veteran. So this is where, um, after when he led all the chiefs, there was 12 of us, and we were known as Council for Yukon Indians. So there was 12 chiefs, and I'm glad that I was one of them that helped to start this and it's very, very encouraging today to see it moving. And especially when we wanted to get get with the with the land claims when they were talked about it, because we've become aware after a while that the Indian Act didn't even apply to us, and yet they were ruling us by it. So. We wanted to get the message across before before Indian affairs that, that the people used to govern themselves. Not money wise, but but where we lived in the country. And after a while there's we realized that there were so many other laws that you had to follow, especially with uh, our renewable side what our people depended on, but we didn't have a say how things were that we had to live by. We wanted to have an input. That was our big message. A lot of people were scared of it when we talk about land claims because they thought we wanted to sell the Yukon. 
wasn't what it was. We just wanted to get involved, especially when it come to education of our children, our health for our, for our people. And like I say, I'm glad after all this time that we finally started to see some of it that we started of working towards for the betterment of our people, both native and non-native here in the Yukon, because we all have to live here. And it's nice to see that we're getting involved, like education for our, for our younger people. And where will we have anything to offer to our young people? This is what we want, and this is what we see start to come around. So. Hopefully that it will carry on and we'll still hear a few years from now to, to, to talk about and to see how far we've come. Anyway, I'll talk to them more later. So. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Uh, in my haste to jump right to our speakers, uh, I was... Uh, prompted here that we have a, a brief video we want to, uh, to play as well, just to give you a little bit of context for, for this that has been uh, put together. I believe you can find it on our, uh, uh, the website Mapping the Way, so I'll just uh, let us play that and we'll just have a quick gander at it. The Yukon Indian chiefs sum up their position in one sentence which reads, many of our people feel that our grievances are so great that there is no way we can be compensated for what has happened to us. Having said that, Chief Elijah Smith of the Native Brotherhood doesn't bother about legal or aboriginal rights. Rather, he works from the assumption that Ottawa has a political and moral obligation to make a deal with the Yukon Indians, who have never signed treaties like their brothers in southern Canada. The Indians say it will take more than cash to solve their problems. They want to participate in the development of their land. In their words, we will not sell our heritage for a quick buck or a temporary job. On that understanding, they're leaving the specifics open to negotiation, the amount of land, the cash settlement, the percentage of royalties. We are not here looking for a handout. We are here with a plan that will cost the Canadian taxpayer much less than if the present government policies and program continue. This approach which you have taken in here is one, therefore, which is very welcome to the government. We think that it is uh, a much, much uh, more fruitful way of solving the problems than trying to rewrite history. Okay, that's a heck of an ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we are, uh, maybe I guess in that theme, I think the, uh, this process has helped, I think, First Nations help to to make their own history. And so I guess with that, um, maybe just some of the questions uh, that we've been, can you guys uh, each kind of in your own perspective tell us uh, how you guys came up with the idea of, of this document together today for children tomorrow? You know, you know, how did that, uh, that idea come to be to the point where you actually went to Ottawa and gave them the document. What was the thinking behind that? So maybe I'll start with you this time, Sam. Well, like I was talking about that, um, like the chiefs used to meet a lot, and when they talked about um, th that we wanted something in place for our younger people, really we are thinking about it wasn't for us today, but the ones that's following behind that we wanted something better in place for them. This, I think that's where this title came out, Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow, so that we'll always have something to, to work on. And like I said, it's very encouraging to see that it started to take place where we started to get involved a little more here and there and also getting into businesses and all this kind of good stuff. And it took a lot of 
not only this one trip, there was a lot of trips after that. And one of them that is, that I remember when we were in the parliament, they gave us a tour of the parliament and naturally Ray Jackson, that small little guy there, we had to make him sit in the speaker's chair in the House of Parliament. <laughs> little did I know, I'll be one of them that had to <laughs> sit as speaker in the House for the Yukon. <laughs> but anyway, that, and, and like um, Elijah had a, had a way to meet with all these ministers, you know, like we come to House of Parliament and all Elijah has to spoke, speak to someone that he wanted to see a certain minister, they made room for him, so we were very fortunate to have a good leader like that. that can really meet with those people, the people that you wanted to meet, and like the whole thing why Yukon land, Yukon land Claims document was so unique, because the government of Canada, this is the first one they ever seen that the native people wanted to sit down to negotiate. And another funny part about that, first when they start looking at the papers, one of the big questions was, how long is this going to take? No more than six months. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty years later, we were still... <laughs> but I'm glad to say that Teslin was one of the first four to, to sign the agreement. Uh, leading up to this document, we had uh, many meetings uh, in Whitehorse. We would bring the chief and councillors and to come into Whitehorse, and we would meet many times throughout these years leading up to this document to be actually ready to to uh, present to the government. And we would sit around in the community, uh, the uh, Yukon Hall. I think it was called the Yukon Hall or the Yukon Indian Center. We would meet in the, um, in the auditorium area and we'd sit there and we would talk. And I, if you've gone through this document, these are the items, these are the things we had talked about. Every community had put a list of some of the things they wished to see within their community. And a lot of it, as you see today at that time, we didn't have any of this. All we had was our community, our house, and our leaders, according to the Indian Act. We were governed at that time by the Indian Act. And um, to me, it's not a very good law that we have in Canada, but I also have to respect other elders across, or other First Nations in Canada that do uh, govern themselves by the Indian Act. So. Um, but for us, it was a law that did not work in the Yukon for our people. So we would have meetings, many, many meetings at the Yukon Hall, and we would invite other organizations, like the Indian Women's Organizations were invited. The non-status Indians were also invited. They participate in a lot of our discussions. So everything was thought out well and talked out well. And when the time came to talk about what shall we call this document, that was a huge discussion. It took a while, and it's something we didn't rush about. We sat and we discussed it very thoroughly, and then we collectively agreed that this is the document. And like Sam said, we were thinking of the younger future generation. We did not want the future to go through what we had lived. It was not a very nice uh, way that we were, we were lived and we wanted to make it better. So it's, like I say, together today for our children tomorrow. And that tomorrow, to me, is here today. We have a lot of young leaders. You look around, you see a lot of young leaders at the council level uh, running for chiefs, running for central organization, running for the national organization. This is what we want to see. 
it's here. We're coming here. And um, so it's, it's, it was a well thought out title and it's a very good title for us. And it's, 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 it's almost like your, your, uh, your vision. It makes you work so hard to, to go that way and, and to work on it and to have these agreements. Thank you, Judy. <clears throat> I think it's, uh, what I find interesting about that, when you, when you read through it and you look at the, uh, those lists of the community interest, all this has to be remembered that uh, while this came forward in 1973, it wasn't until 1960 that Indian people actually had the right to vote in Canada. So to, to go from not being able to participate in the political process in Canada to all of a sudden going to Ottawa and saying, you know, this process that we're now part of, we wanted to make real change for us, I think was a, a huge leap of faith by, uh, by you know, our communities and our leadership back then. So I think that was uh, that's quite remarkable. I guess I would ask, uh, kind of leaping forward, you know, kind of on the point of you know, where we are today and what you've been thinking about, um, uh, you know, in thinking about it. You know, did you guys, you know, maybe not envision exactly what we have today, uh, but uh, think that you know, when you look at the the strength of some of the governments, first nation governments we have in the Yukon, the the you know the working relationship and and their role within the the, the territorial. Uh, voice uh, and the role they have in their own regions now, their own communities, to, is, I mean, I, I assume that's part of what was we were wanting back then, but is this, you know, when you look at it now, do you, are those some of the things you guys were talking about back then, but wanting to see about the, you know, the, as, as you said, Sam, the, the strength of our, our economic presence in the Yukon now? Um, I just wonder if maybe, Judy, you could start this time to maybe just talk a bit about where we are today and how that, when you reflect back, what that, you know, what you guys were talking about back then and about today? I think it's uh, what I'm finding is very um, trying and trying to make these uh, these agreements implement. To implement these agreements is is a huge task, and it's I think it's a struggle every day with every society and with every government. And people need to remember. It was all three parties that signed on to these agreements. So we all own this agreement. This agreement belongs to the people of the Yukon. So each and every one of us in this room have a duty to have these agreements bring forward because we felt, at, and I still feel today, these agreements are about partnership, building a relationship. We all live here. So we want to make it what is better for the people of the Yukon. And it's, it's something that's a, it's a real struggle. I see it every day. And the other thing, too, is I see is, is carrying out these agreements back at the community level. You've got to remember, for a long time, we were governed by the Indian Act. And um, that's another item I could talk about for a long time because it was, I found that doc document to be very discriminatory, especially to the women. And... Um, so it's a struggle to change from the Indian Act to a self-governing and to really understand what do we mean by self-governing. And each First Nation in the Yukon have constitution. And to really understand that document, what is a constitution? What is it there for? What does it stand for? What does it do for our community? So there's still a lot of little struggles there. Uh, First Nations have a lot of jurisdiction and authority and to bring that forward and bring that out and for all governments to stand on to, to work that out. It's not just simple little agreements that we're gonna have between you and I to make something work. It's in the agreements, use your agreements, go to different sections and to your agreements and make it happen. So we all have that responsibility. Yeah, there's still some uh, some parts of the agreements that still having difficulties with, especially the financial transfer. You know, like a lot of it, they're having a hard time to have enough money to make the programs work. They, they signed it okay, but they never transferred the whole thing. And they, they still want you to do 
do, do the work on such limited funds compared to what they had. This kind of thing, it's, it's hard. So some of the agreements has, has to be brought up and today, a lot of you probably see it that a lot of it has to be taken to courts and hopefully it don't continue like that. But, but all in all, it's still coming out and they're learning to, to work together and hopefully that we don't have to go to the court system to make these, to bring these things to light. After a while, even on the native side, you, you know, even though a lot of it is, is good agreements, but you have to learn to read the small print too. <laughs> and once you see these things, it's, that's when it has to come to light. But there was a time when nobody knew any different. But fortunately that it's coming out and everything, I hope everything will be ironed out where we can all keep Yukon a happy place to live. Because after traveling around a lot of different parts of the world, Yukon is very unique and hope that it stays like that for, for us and for our future. Thank you. Maybe I can, uh, now I know we, we talked about this, uh, maybe give an opportunity for a few questions from the, the audience, if that's so okay with you guys. Uh, uh, so at this point, maybe we'll uh, entertain two or three questions if people have them. Uh, you've got some uh, incredible resources here to, uh, to, if you have any questions you'd like to ask. Uh, mine is more of a statement, I think, than a question. Um, I travel quite a bit to the provinces, mostly Ontario and BC. And when I talk about First Nations relations in the Yukon, I have to admit that people don't believe how positive it is here. Like they just, they're, I think in their view, the First Nations are not um, living up to what they could be living up to. and. I'm always so proud that I feel, as peoples, we got along very well. And I just wondered if Sam or Judy could comment on um, whether First Nations from across the land are willing to learn more from our positive experience than they might be. Uh, I, d I really don't know, but I do know that in the Yukon, like you said, we do have something very positive here to offer. And um, I know I've been invited to m maybe go to uh, to New Zealand to work with the with the Aboriginals there, about because um, they like they have heard what we are doing here and how we establish this process and how. We um, have self-governing, and they like very interested in agreements. So, it's really entirely up to um, the uh, First Nations across Canada to um, to invite us from the north to go and to be able to speak to them about our agreements. Because I really think um, I shouldn't say I think I know we have very good agreements. When they start taking you to court, you know you got something good. They're trying to build a loophole. You know, like a lot of the, after the land claims was, were signed, not only the Yukon, but the rest of Canada and different parts of the world really was looking at about how, how this come about, how, how the, especially the First Nation people that wanted to work among the rest, the rest. Well, this is why I said that, that we, hopefully that we can continue to work together to make a, a better country.
continue to keep Yukon working together with the Native people and for, for our younger generation where they can work together and go to school together, and learn from each other, and because we all have to live here. And I just want to get a message to our younger people. I know a lot of you need a lot of encouragement, but we're here for you, so please do not be afraid to ask any of us to try to help in any which way we can to make a better tomorrow. So thank you. So are there other questions? Uh, I think uh, Sam was kind of prompting some of the younger people in the audience to ask a question here. So, Hi. I was just curious if it was um, intentional to present the document on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> But that was a good thought. Whoever thought of it? <laughs> I don't. I don't know how how it, how it ended up on Valentine's Day. But after a while, we sure laughed about it. We, we sure gave a good Valentine present to the Prime Minister of Canada, Trudeau. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Uh, Tosh Southwick, uh, thank you so much for your time. I have a hundred and fifty questions. I could spend all day with you guys. Um, as somebody from the generation about uh, who has to implement all of the hard work that you guys did, one of the things that I personally struggle with is how do you take a document that is very legal, very Western, and implement our values and our traditions in a way that gives space for every First Nation to be unique, but also takes into the fact that we have to do things like policy in this, this new world. Like, how, how did you envision that balance happening? Well, each First Nation have, uh, we're all under the umbrella final agreement, and then when it comes to a First Nation, there are special um, within their, very unique within their own government. What you need to start doing, and I just experienced this this morning, I went to a meeting, and they were talking about an MOU on the education, and not once in that presentation they made any reference to the land claims agreements or to their constitution. It's a same old MOU, we want to do this, we want to do that, but there was no mention. To me, if you, when you're going to start to do something, start looking at these agreements. What part of those land claims agreements are you applying here? For that community or for the whole of the Yukon? And that's what's going to help. Move, this, move these agreements forward. But if you just plan, talk about it, and make no reference to them, that's not implementation. So I think we need to start opening up these agreements. Everybody, leaders, people that are in charge of uh, um, a department should have these agreements on their desk and start referring to them. and. It's all laid out there. There's implementation plan. We have our implementation plan. It's all there. We just need to start opening these pages and start applying them and, and see where how it all fits in there. It's there. Like um, Judy said, uh, like Judy was talking about, there's a lot of things in this uh, document that started to be implemented now. And, but some of it, uh, you, you have to really work with s someone that could maybe you help you along, work, work to better to understand these, these things, where words come from where it's coming from and how it could be applied, especially in this day and age. Things have changed over the years. And it's getting a lot different and a lot 
different for our younger people, so but if we can still help along the best we can with our younger people, I think we'll we'll still continue to be together for a better Yukon. So thank you. The signatories are, we're starting to lose the original signatories and negotiators. How do we keep the spirit and intent of the original umbrella final agreement and this document um, that aren't written or um, just keeping that original spirit and intent and not kind of sticking to the legal, the legal interpretation. I would say um, continue to have more and more sessions like this, uh, conference, workshops, um, speaker series is, is really good. You can have a lot of that going on within your own community and bring forward the people that were there and, th and they will help you. I'm glad to come and be invited. I will be glad to attend and have these sessions and experience because I was there, you know, and, um, and what it was all leading up to. I know what life was like in 1973 and where we have come and where we're at today. So I would say continue to talk about it, have sessions, and just keep it going. After today, I might remember something. Oh my God, I should have said this, but <laughs> I'm around. <laughs> yeah, again, I, this could be a, a very good beginning of where to get together like this to to talk, talk about different issues that or how 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 it could be applied to to help other people really to understand and to try to help and continue how these programs and some of these things that that's in it's in this document that could be applied to 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 help you even today so I could add a couple more uh, I think you're gonna there it was mentioned that there's going to be more series on this right speaking series but I also like to acknowledge there's two people in the crowd here we should definitely I would just say there was there's three. Uh, we have Vic Victor Matander, we have Shirley Adamson. They were very involved. <laughs> and uh, Victor was the chief negotiator. And uh, we have Elbert James back there, who was the vice chair of CYFN when I was the chair. <laughs> so I think we need to acknowledge their presence and in, in here, and we have many speakers coming up. You're not going to want to miss the others coming up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, coming today. I was just kind of thumbing through this book uh, uh, today. I, I do keep a copy of this in my desk, uh, and I find it, it does uh, provide a little bit of grounding. I think that when I read through the various chapters of the of the UFA and the final agreements. Um, I do go back to this quite often to help give me some context to it. Um, I think this, along with the, the objectives that are set out in each of the chapters, gives a, a better understanding, I think, at least for me, of what was being thought of at the time and what was the, the intent behind it. So I think you, you don't just read this in isolation of the agreement. You don't read the agreements in isolation of this. These two are very much a... Uh, a package, in, in my view, and uh, you know that's how a lot of how I I think we, you think through some of the, the challenges that uh, we have in 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 a, in a land claim agreement that is a very technical agreement, and you know even after uh, seven years of uh, university and uh, a lot of years practicing law, I still don't have uh, <laughs> you know nearly all the answers myself. So yeah, it definitely has uh, you know a lot of that is in, in the flavor and the spirit and intent that and understand that context. What I found interesting about it, uh, when I went back and I was kind of reading it again today, 
Um, and we're just in, in the context of what we're thinking about here today on this, um, it was interesting. That this, this document is broken down into the past, the present, and the future in the context of 1973. Where are they coming from? Where were they? And where do they see themselves going? And I found it very interesting that in, when they look about tomorrow, um, they talk about it that this wasn't about just them. That you know, this is a settlement for tomorrow, not today. We are trying to tell you uh, some of the reasons why we will not be able to solve the problems immediately. They recognized it was a journey. That it was going to take some time to do it. Um, they also spoke about how, you know, if we are successful, the day will come when all Yukoners, this isn't just about First Nations, all Yukoners, <clears throat> will be proud of our heritage and culture and will respect the, our Indian identity. <clears throat> Only then will we be equal in, as Canadian brothers. <coughs> Excuse me, it's still a little dry here. Um, I think that that is... It's a very profound way to look at what they were thinking about, or to, to think about what they were they were looking at. I guess that was their vision, and I think when we look at today, and people ask about what what do we think of today, I think you know it, there definitely is that flavor to yeah. the conversation now. It's it's a, it's a it's a conversation where you know the men and the you know Aboriginal men and Aboriginal women are are equal. Um, that you know, it's not you know, don't have that disparity that the Indian Act had created with the genders. It uh, there's still some challenges, and we still have a lot of work to do, but I think that there are th those types of conversations are different. The conversations, a respectful conversation dialogue between governments as governments has significantly evolved since that time. We still have to do better, um, and we will do better, but I think that there is you know, this understanding that it's, it, it is all of our agreements, it is all of us working together on this that is, uh, I think, has a, you know, shows continues to show great potential for the, the vision that was uh, 45 years ago today, so, or uh, this year. So with that, I would just ask if there are any other yes. final I comments you'd like to make before we, we close up here. Okay. Yep, I have a few. Um, I always go back, and Dave Joe was our, our chief negotiator at the time, and, and back in 1973, he was our executive director. So when the prime minister asked him how long this is going to take, I remember Dave Joe very clearly saying six months. <laughs> and through our whole uh, land claims dis uh, nego uh, discussion, there's times he, he would come forth and say, and trying to get the message across to the government that if you don't want two schools in a community or two this or two that, because this is where we're coming from, we're coming from like, if we're gonna have a, a school in a community, it's gonna be one school. That was our our position. But if you're not going to listen to us and you're not going to come across and work with us and, and make it happen, we're going to have a red fire truck and a white fire truck. <laughs> so that, <he's laughs> that was his way of expressing to them that uh, this is what's going to happen. And I remember that when we're down in Ottawa and we're getting ready, like I said, we're getting ready for the, the meeting with the Prime Minister. And we stayed in this hotel, <laughs> and I remember, I'm not going to mention any names here, but I remember a chief um, <laughs> was down in the lobby, and he was feeling good. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> Dave telling, our, telling the story where he had to go down and, and get the chief to take him back to find to his room. But I guess apparently the chief was riding up and down the elevator trying to find, <laughs> trying to find his room. And when he got off in the elevator, every elevator looked alike. It, the, the decor was all same color, every floor. So he had a hard time trying to find his room. He think he was going to his room, knock on the door, but it's not his room. So Dave had to go down and rescue him and get him back to his room. But I remember too, before we met with the prime minister, we had to go up to the, to the parliament for, for dinner, for lunch. And they brought in the um, the um, the soup, which was uh, was clear, and we had a chief sitting there, <laughs> and he put cream, and he put sugar, <laughs> and there was this bowl with two handles. He said, "What kind of cup is this?" <laughs> said, 
And he took a sip of his coffee, he thought. Uh, it turned out to be soup, not coffee. So those are some of the little things that, uh, little things that do, did happen. And um, thank you very much. And it was really good attendance. And we'll see you at the next one. I do would just like to say thank you very much to all of you. It certainly was a good turnout. And thank you and tells me that all of you are interested. Th thank you very much. Or maybe I should say it the way Elvis Presley would say it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, based on that sign-off, I will keep <laughs> my response very short. Uh, just want to acknowledge and, and thank again uh, Judy and Sam for your time and your words today. I think that uh, you know, your perspective and obviously your, your lessons learned and the paths traveled by each of you um, has uh, provided us a, a lot of insight and perspective today and definitely demonstrates the, the wisdom that you guys have gathered over the years. Uh, We'd also like to thank the college uh, for, again, for partnering with us and, and helping to organize this event today. <laughs> As said, we will uh, we will be putting forward uh, a schedule of these events uh, throughout the year that we will keep you posted on, and we'll be working with the college to, to post the schedule for those, so that'll be uh, coming forward. As well, uh, as we've said, February 14th is... Uh, fast approaching, that will be the anniversary. Uh, so uh, first off, if you don't have your Valentine's present for your partner, I suggest you go out and do that. Uh, but also, uh, as a Valentine's Day event, you may want to take your partner to, uh, to the CYFN celebration, which will be, they will be hosting a gala and celebration for the 75th anniversary uh, coming up on, the, on Friday. And that uh, it will include an afternoon uh, of public events opening uh, to everybody as well as a gala event in the evening and there are tickets available to that for that at 2FN and I've also been told that uh, if people are interested in acquiring a copy of the uh, of this document uh, contact uh, or go through the 2FN website and they uh, you should be able to obtain a copy of it there so with that uh, thank you very much thank you to our panelists uh, good afternoon